You mentioned that the man on fire was crushed under Sohalanthropus in its hangar. Yeah. He was caught under the wheels of its transport platform. Yeah. But his body wasn't found. What? We searched the area the moment we arrived, but there was no trace of him. I wasn't hallucinating. I know. I trust you on that. That means someone must have taken the body. But when I got there, everything was still as it was. Even Skullface hadn't been touched. I can't see a reason to sneak into a place like that and drag out the biggest, heaviest guy there. What are you getting at? The only option left is... He got up and walked away. That platform ran him over. Just ran him over. You're saying that's not enough? I don't want to believe it, but... Maybe not. He shrugs off bullets, even rocket strikes. There's no reason to think that would finish him. It seems ridiculous, but... I'll start gathering eyewitness accounts, just in case. If you dig up anything concrete, I want to know. You'll be the first, if I dig anything up. But I hope to hell I don't. No kidding. Volgan, the Gru Colonel, was burned alive with a Shagoha during Operation Snake Eater 20 years ago. Despite suffering severe burns to his entire body, he still clung to life. After you left Seleniarsk, Volgan's body was taken to a research institute in the outskirts of Moscow. But modern medicine couldn't explain why he was still alive. Not that the colonel was any ordinary man to begin with. That constant electric current he had running through his body that he could unleash at will. To be honest, I was always uncomfortable around him. Thought I might get electrocuted just by standing nearby. The Institute studying him was tasked with investigating and developing human paranormal abilities. The comatose Volgan was used to further the Soviet Union's research into such abilities. But not long ago, the facility burned to the ground. And Volgan's body was never found among the rubble, even though the fire started in the room where they were keeping him. This occurred at around the same time you woke up. If Skullface was right, and a thirst for revenge can turn a man into a demon and keep the dead alive, then this man on fire who's been coming after us ever since you woke up, well, that just might be what's left of our old friend Volgan. It's not over yet. Back in 64, in Seleniarsk, you brought his plans for a utopia down in flames. That grudge is what's keeping him alive. The day the research facility holding Volgan burned down, a Soviet jumbo passenger jet happened to crash nearby, far away to the north of that hospital in Cyprus. On board the plane was a young boy who was being studied at the same facility. The plane fell to Earth from over 8,000 feet, but the boy's body was the only one not recovered. At almost exactly the same time as the crash, Volgan awoke in that facility. According to the Research Institute's documents, the gifts this boy demonstrated included psychokinesis and telepathy. To protect his mind from being inundated with other people's thoughts, he always wore a kind of gas mask. A rudimentary form of psychic insulation, apparently. We don't know where this boy is, but if Skullface is connected to him, we may cross paths with him yet. This boy is part of a new age where nothing we understand about the world makes sense anymore. Don't let your guard down. So what were they doing at Enzoya Badia, Baloo? That facility with all the people laid out in rows. The abandoned factory Shibani was held in. It is precisely as you guessed. Like Anna was coding languages into the vocal cord parasites. They infected the subjects with the parasites, then made an incision in the throat to expose the vocal cords. That allowed them to play recordings of a desired language directly to the parasites. And the parasites learned the languages that way. That's some teaching method. I just don't get how a bunch of bugs had the brain power for it. They don't. Do not judge them by human standards. They do not learn as a function of intellect. Then how do they do it? What language the parasites react to is coded into their genes. You could expose the Japanese.
Japanese strain to English for years, and he would never learn the language and react to it. The pronunciation, rhythm, and structure are different. But what about, say, Spanish and Portuguese? Linguistically, the two are very close. Yeah, they're both Ibero-Romance languages. Even so, a Spanish language mating pair exposed to Portuguese will not copulate. Only when they hear Spanish. Only then. And the majority of their offspring will be the same. So it's a literal case of a mother tongue. But if that's so, I don't see how the different strains can be created in the first place. Well, among the many thousands of offspring, there may be just a few that react to Portuguese. You're talking about mutations. Correct. Playing the tapes helps to identify the mutant strains. Those specimens are then isolated and bred with one another. From their children, specimens that react more strongly to Portuguese can again be selected and bred. Repeating this process creates a strain that reacts solely to Portuguese and never to Spanish. Mutation and selection. No different to breeding roses. So you kept increasing the change over the generations, adapting them to languages from all over the world. You must have taken a hell of a lot of patience. More like patience. Just how many died for this? There's something I still don't get. In order to tell which larvae will react to Portuguese, you'd have to let them develop and then see which copulate. That means you'd need tens of thousands of guinea pigs. There's no way you could do that in a facility that small. For normal selective breeding methods, you would be right. But there is a more effective selection method when training the vocal cord parasites. <sighs> Go on. It is not only when mating that the parasites listen for language. Shortly before hatching, larvae display markedly increased activity in reaction to a particular language. The active eggs can be identified under a black light. So the eggs that react to Portuguese are selectively placed in the throats of subjects. So you see, narrowing down strains that react to the target language is an effective process. Though I'm sure that even so, many lost their lives to create the various strains taken against their will into that, that dungeon. There are two reasons for playing the tapes for the parasites. One, to isolate the eggs that respond to the target language. And two, to cause the specimens raised from the selected eggs to mate. I get how the system works, but why do they respond to language before they even hatch? It's not like they can mate from inside an egg. It is because the larvae learn the language before hatching. You mentioned that what language the parasites respond to is hard-coded into their genes, and that they don't have the brain power to actually learn a language. But then you say that the larvae at Nzoya Badiabulu were learning the languages in the egg. Your story doesn't add up. Your country is home to a unique songbird. The Japanese bush warbler. Sure, what of it? What a beautiful call it has. But no bush warbler can sing it perfectly at the start. As chicks, they can barely chirp at all. They must learn from their parents and other adult birds. Only then can they sing properly and attract females. So naturally, there are individual differences in each bird's call. Though they start on the same footing, each bird is influenced by its teachers. And the parasites are the same? Like the birds, the parasites have a genetic predisposition towards a particular language. But while in the egg, the larvae's ears are tweaked by listening to the voice of the host. This tweaking ensures that the grown parasites will react better to the host's speech pattern. 
Why would they have an ability like that? Well, there are distinct regional differences within even the same language. Rare is the language that has no unique dialects. Yes, learning the host's speech pattern before hatching attunes the larvae to whatever twist of pronunciation it will encounter. This adaptive ability is what makes them so formidable. I see. So a language requires selective breeding, but the parasites can learn dialects by themselves. Of course, having the egg stage larvae listen to the tapes in the factory was not meant to teach them. It was more important to use that trait of theirs to identify the mutated strains. As I mentioned earlier, is that really accurate enough to use as a weapon? You could wipe out a neighboring ethnic group by accident if their pronunciation is too close. What you say is true. In that sense, they are imperfect as ethnic cleansers. But for his purposes, they are good enough. His objective was not to exterminate any one ethnic group, but to render the world's lingua franca, English, inert. Code talker. Haven't seen you eat a single thing since you got here. Let me guess. Photosynthesis? Oh? What makes you say that? Well, a long time ago, I knew someone with a similar ability. Well, you are correct. Most of my body is covered with parasites. I supply them with water, and in return, I receive sugars they produce when exposed to light. Uh-huh. It isn't just my skin either. The parasites also act as my eyes. They have replaced many of my internal organs as well. It is thanks to them that I live on after over a century. How did you obtain them anyway? Through your research? I would like to say as much, but there is more to it than that. Let me take you back 20 years. I had hit a dead end with my parasite research. Then I was approached by a foundation. They said they had a sample of an unusual strain of parasite. Which foundation? Apparently, they had links to ARPA. But that is all I learned. I was somewhat ignorant of the ways of the world. Just being able to study it was enough for me. Yeah, I've heard that before. Go on. Half in doubt, I visited them to discover the body of an old man. Well, to be precise, his partial remains. A collection of parts, you could say. The man had died in an explosion. An old man, you say? His flesh had not decomposed. In fact, the tissue's cells were still metabolizing. The parasite had infected or should I say assimilated with the tissues and was keeping them alive. I became obsessed with studying the body parts. The tissue, the parasite had... Tucker, haven't seen you eat a single thing since you got here. Let me guess. Photosynthesis? Oh? What makes you say that? Well, a long time ago, I knew someone with a similar ability. Well, you are correct. Most of my body is covered with parasites. I supply them with water, and in return, I receive sugars they produce when exposed to light. Uh-huh. It isn't just my skin either. The parasites also act as my eyes. They have replaced many of my internal organs as well. It is thanks to them that I live on after over a century. How did you obtain them anyway? Through your research? I would like to say as much, 
But there is more to it than that. Let me take you back 20 years. I had hit a dead end with my parasite research. Then I was approached by a foundation. They said they had a sample of an unusual strain of parasite. Which foundation? Apparently, they had links to ARPA. But that is all I learned. I was somewhat ignorant of the ways of the world. Just being able to study it was enough for me. Yeah, I've heard that before. Go on. Half in doubt, I visited them to discover the body of an old man. Well, to be precise, his partial remains. A collection of parts, you could say. The man had died in an explosion. An old man, you say? His flesh had not decomposed. In fact, the tissue's cells were still metabolizing. The parasite had infected, or should I say assimilated with, the tissues, and was keeping them alive. I became obsessed with studying the body parts, foregoing food and even sleep. Every day was filled with new discoveries. The parasite's biology, internal anatomy, life cycle. But there was only so much I could learn through observation. And so I made a decision to truly know the parasites. I had to live with them. So you implanted them inside you from the dead man's flesh? Correct. <sighs> it was quite a gamble whether or not they would adapt to me. But fortunately, it appears I was compatible with them. Or perhaps, through my many years of research, my immune system learned to tolerate them. Were they that body's only parasite? Yes. However, there was a separate specimen that supplied its host with adrenaline in response to pain. And yet another that could control insects at will through secreting heterogeneous pheromones. I wanted exposure to them, to take them into me. But my wishes were denied. Their records, though, provided clues that helped advance my research. Would you care to join me? A life spent never worrying about food is a most wonderful one. I think I'll pass, but thanks. This has been helpful. The one that covers the parasite that lives on the surface of the skull's bodies is what gives them their power, similar to my children who live in my skin. I modified the parasites I isolated from the body of that old man differentiating them with various abilities. One that can blend perfectly into its surroundings by exposing the pigments in its cells at will. Another that by harboring multiple species of metallic archaea can oxidize and reduce metal. Isolating the one that covers and transplanting it into an artificial medium should provide the same abilities as the skulls but they can only subsist within a human body. Once transplanted into the medium, they will eventually die. Another thing, the weakness of the one that covers is desiccation. Their surface moisture loss is greater than ours. The reason they give off mist is to alleviate this by releasing the salts inside them as microparticles. Water vapor condenses around them, appearing as mist. But this dries out the atmosphere until they cannot even produce mist. And once their supply of water from the host runs out, the parasites are in danger. They, along with their host, enter a form of suspended animation. However, a similar effect occurs if they come into contact with a large amount of water. Rain, for instance, the one that covers will temporarily abandon other processes in his eagerness to absorb the water. Pitiholone. Make the weather your ally. There's something.
something I've been wondering. Why are you called Code Talker? During World War II, the U.S. military used the languages of different tribes, including the Navajo, as codes, right? I know the term Code Talker was used to mean people sent to the battlefield to speak in those codes. Were you one of them? Our mother tongue was indeed used for war. But I did not go. I was already over the conscription age. However, I was made to help craft the codes that were spoken. So in a wider sense, you could call me a code talker for that. Navajo is a complex language. And virtually no one outside the U.S. speaks it. The must have thought it was the perfect language to use as a code. Yeah, in the end, the Japanese never cracked it. The cipher is king in information warfare. Of course, they didn't simply speak in Navajo. They created substitutions for words according to a code book, and then translated those into our language. Young Diné was sent to the front lines of the Pacific Theater as code talkers. To fight is an honor for the Diné. They were the pride of our people. But I cannot say this history brings me joy. Words are alive. When they are spoken, life is breathed into them. They become a part of the listener. Our words were transformed into lifeless ciphers and used for war. This, after the Black Anna spent generations suppressing the language. Yeah, I'm sorry. So I guess we shouldn't be calling you Code Talker, huh? No, I do not mind. The reason Skullface called me Code Talker was because I also am responsible for coding language into the vocal cord parasites. I am the same as those young warriors, used for a cipher's sake. I must never forget that. The name, Code Talker, is a lesson carved into my being. You said Skullface ordered you to weaponize the vocal cord parasites. But you also said he wasn't the reason. And he wasn't. I was seduced by the parasites. That is a fact. <laughs> How? You mean from your curiosity as a scientist? That I cannot deny. But there is more to it. The story goes back to the 19th century. To my earliest memory. One day, a man from the government visited our Hogan. Our home. I cried as he yanked me from my mother's arms and took me away to an Indian boarding school. From that day forward, I became George. This was the name my teacher gave me. I was forced to give up my Diné name, forbidden from speaking anything but English. If we dared utter a word of filthy Navajo, the teacher made us eat a bar of soap. Yeah. That was the U.S. government's education policy for Native Americans. To erase our words was like erasing our people. Their education was tantamount to ethnic cleansing. Over time, the overt persecution of our language stopped. But to this day, it continues to be eaten away by the lingua franca, that is English. Many of the Diné outside the reservations can speak nothing else. And it isn't just our language. Across the world, minority languages are being destroyed by dominant languages. Many are on the verge of extinction. Hmm. Enter the vocal cord parasites. Yes. I began thinking that minority languages needed some sort of deterrent against dominant languages. In order that they, that their peoples and cultures would survive. It was then that I came across literature at the foundation claiming that man acquired language thanks to a type of parasite. One that distinguishes between languages as a precursor to reproduction. If I could just resurrect it, make it more pathogenic, I would have my deterrent against English. But I failed to hide that aim from Skullface. He noticed. Yes, I wanted to retaliate against the English language. 
though never did I intend to actually use it as he planned. You know how the story ends. I was forced to study how to make the parasites compatible with all the world's languages. All but English. However, he in fact secretly isolated an English strain. I will not be held prisoner by the man's phantom. The English strain must not be allowed to exist either. I have no doubt Skullface's plan is almost complete. At that point, I will no longer be of use to him. I must leave behind this record at least. A record of how the ancient vocal cord parasites became these abominable ethnic cleansing parasites. I believe he has two purposes for the ethnic cleansing parasites. The first, as their name suggests, is ethnic cleansing. This conflict between East and West that envelops the world will not last much longer. Once the Cold War ends, and the weight of America and the Soviet Union is lifted away, the ethnic conflicts they kept suppressed will all rise to the surface. It is not difficult to imagine that the radical sides will begin cleansing their adversaries. But what if an ethnic cleansing parasite matching the language of the aggressors were to be unleashed? The aggressors would be washed off the earth. At the very least, the idea that retaliation could eradicate your people would prove a powerful deterrent. The second purpose is the Englishization of the world. To cipher the organization, this is probably their main use. Man thinks in words, or rather, words are man's very means of thinking. If you erase a word representing some concept, the concept itself disappears from the world. Nishone means beautiful in Navajo, but the image that comes to mind when we say Nishone differs from the Black Anas, beautiful. An azure sky, a rolling landscape, lush greenery, the meaning we place in Nejone has its roots in Diné culture. If we lose the word Nejone, the images of our beautiful homeland would be washed away into oblivion along with it. Just as Orwell indicated years ago, Cypher being based in America is pushing Englishization for this very reason. Suppose all five billion people on this planet come to read, speak, and think in English. Their wills could also be streamlined under English. Cypher's control would be all the easier. Economic governance would progress in leaps and bounds. The ethnic cleansing parasites would be a great aid in accomplishing this goal. There is no need to destroy every language besides English. All they need to do is weaken other dominant languages competing with it. Russian, Chinese, Arabic. If people know they risk their lives speaking such languages, they will flock to the lingua franca that is English. Cypher need not even focus attention on smaller languages. After all, they are already being eaten away by English. Business, education, film, commodities. English has permeated every area of global society. I can see this when I look at young Dene. Some of them have already lost their grasp of the Navajo language. It is said that over 2,000 languages of the world are facing extinction. This very moment, cultural concepts and forms of expression are disappearing forever. The spread of electronic networks gives greater meaning to Englishization. Networks have no national borders, but basing them on a single language 
they can penetrate deeper into and between people. That basic point of unity provides the ideal environment for someone who aims to control people's wills. But how does this differ from building the Tower of Babel? The ethnic cleansing parasites attempt to rob man of his words. Such irony. It was the vocal cord parasites that gave words to him in the first place. Ancient man had no language. Unable to produce complex sounds due to the structure of the throat, he could communicate only through simple vocalizations and gestures. Then the vocal cord parasites infected his larynx. Man's transition to walking upright did not gift him solely with intelligence, but also with his voice. At the time, the vocal cord parasites never harmed man. They merely took a small measure of nourishment. In fact, you could call it a symbiotic relationship. Some animal species use particular vocalization patterns to attract a female and reproduce. Songbirds, certain insects, and also the vocal cord parasites. The difference is that the parasites themselves did not produce sounds. Rather, they had their hosts, man, do it for them. Once secure on the human host vocal cords, a male vocal cord parasite caused the host to produce a certain sound pattern, something like a warble of a bird. Meanwhile, females parasitizing other host pharynxes need only wait upon hearing the sound pattern of an attractive mate. They would manipulate their hosts into making contact with the person it came from. The female traveled through his host's saliva to the other host's vocal cords where the male was waiting and the pair copulated. We can only imagine how the female manipulated his host, but it was probably through smell. Smells traveled directly to the limbic system via the olfactory cilia in the nasal cavity. Volatile compounds released by the female would stimulate the limbic system, which controls instincts, making the host feel amorous. This kind of sexual selection naturally led to competition between the male parasites. Males that had their hosts produce sounds perceived by females as more attractive succeeded in copulating and producing offspring. Evolutionary traits caused by sexual selection are curious. The peacock's feathers, the mannequin's dance, the firefly's luminescence pattern. Even with courtship behaviors that are not advantageous to survival, those individuals that excel in them produce offspring, and it escalates with each generation. The same was true of the vocal cord parasites. Courtship vocalization rhythms and intonations became more sophisticated, and in order for man to produce such sounds, they had to alter his vocal organs. By lowering the position of the larynx and developing resonating chambers, they enabled more complex pronunciations. But that was not all. The vocal cord parasites activated a transcription factor that would later control man's language ability. A protein that due to its appearance is called 4 kid box protein P2, or Fox P2. Activating this transcription factor led to the development of brain function capable of creating sophisticated frequency changes. This was the pinnacle of the vocal cord parasite's prosperity. However, this sophisticated pronunciation control was too useful for man to ignore. Once human yeah, sexual activity ceased to be only seasonal, and having lost pigment-based sexual characteristics, distinctive vocalizations became the most effective means for humans to attract mates as well. 
combined with logic pathways hardwired into the brain, or universal grammar, it was not long before advanced communication was possible. This was the birth of language. Luckily for man, it was around this time that a particular retrovirus was circulating. While not lethal, it infected not only man, but the vocal cord parasites as well. It is presumed that this virus removed part of the parasite's DNA and reverse transcribed it into man's reproductive cells. It was a vector. Among the genes it transcribed were the ones responsible for the production of language. The vocal cord parasite's vocalization genes were written into the human genome. The parasites were no longer of any use to man now. Man could use his voice as he pleased, when he pleased, hindering the parasites' courtship vocalizations. Having lost their opportunity to reproduce, the parasites died out, leaving behind only the transcribed genes. The vocal cord parasites were once in symbiosis with man. Its genes even became a part of his. Humans and parasites are extremely close. As such, it will be extremely difficult for man's immune system to eliminate the vocal cord parasites. Oh, approaching. Even cutting them out will be no simple matter. Which is exactly why these ethnic cleansing parasites are such a formidable weapon. The rise of the vocal cord parasites goes back approximately 300 million years to the Permian period. At that time, they were not even parasites, but predatory autotrophs. They are believed to have been the common ancestor to the Pentathemida and the Cyclops genus of copepods. However, Earth's environment underwent a violent change at the end of the Permian period. The cause is unclear, but evidence suggests that over 90% of the Earth's organisms at that time died out. The most pronounced threat to the protoparasites was the severe reduction in oxygen concentration. The result was cladogenesis a splitting that gave birth to a new strain that could parasitize other organisms' respiratory apparatus. This survival tactic helped lower their oxygen consumption, and inhabiting the throat kept them securely in contact with inhaled air. The best survivors were those that parasitized the reptiles that flourished at the time. Entering the Triassic period, the reptiles evolved into dinosaurs, and the protoparasites shared in their success. Dinosaurs developed respiratory organs called air sacs to adapt to the low oxygen environment. These in particular helped the protoparasites thrive. But another trial awaited them. The end of the Triassic period saw another drastic change in the Earth's environment. For most parasites, the male and female take the same host. Many are, in fact, hermaphrodites. Originally, the vocal cord parasites were as well. But for any strain to ride out a severe environmental change, it must secure a steady pool of genetic diversity. Another split. Now the newest strain procreated with mates found in other hosts. And in order to increase its encounters with those mates, the new strain utilized the voice of its host. They came to inhabit the host's vocal cords. This truly was the birth of the vocal cord parasite. The parasites developed the host's pharynx to form resonating chambers and used them to produce sophisticated mating calls. The relatively upright posture of the dinosaurs was important in this because the crooked L-shaped pharynx was more suited to the development of resonating chambers. These developments ushered in a time of great prosperity for the parasites. But for the third time, the parasites had a major hurdle to overcome. 
the meteorite impact at the end of the Cretaceous period, which spelled the end of the dinosaurs. With their hosts extinct, the vocal cord parasites had no option but to find a new habitat. Birds, as genetic successors to the dinosaurs with functioning air sac apparatus already in place. Birds were the perfect choice. But the parasites could not survive in birds that flew at high altitudes with thinner air. So they parasitized ground-dwelling birds and altered their respiratory system for the sake of reproduction. They gave the birds the means to produce sophisticated sounds. The syrinx responsible for chirping. This is the proof that points to activation of Fox P2 in songbirds as well as humans. The Cenozoic era began with a rise in oxygen concentration, which helped mammals to evolve and increase in size. The parasites then shifted to humans as a more effective host. Humans' bipedal upright walking meant that our throats could support larger resonating chambers. At first, vocal cord parasites entered humans using birds as their intermediate host. But eventually, they changed to conducting their entire life cycle within human hosts. What happened next is as I have already described. People took the vocalizing prowess given them by the parasites and made it language. And once the parasites could no longer use it as their mating call, they died out. Or in other words, the parasites overcame all evolutionary hurdles except humanity. Skullface shared his opinion on this matter. He said the ethnic cleansers project was sure to succeed. After all, the parasites had a grudge against us humans. To think we awoke them after such a long slumber, just so they could sate their thirst for vengeance. It is terrible, unforgivable, and yet it is what I have done. I learned of the vocal cord parasite's existence in literature belonging to the Foundation. It was little more than a theory. The question was, why does only Homo sapiens among all primates have highly developed language? Human versus everything else. The missing link between these was the mystery that gave rise to this theory. I was fascinated by the idea of their existence. In the Dene creation myth, the Neyo Dene, who first inhabited the world, were insect-like creatures. I came to imagine that those insect-like creatures could be humans living in symbiosis with the vocal cord parasites. But I had not the faintest idea of how I could resurrect them. That is when Skullface came to me. What he offered me was not just assistance with my metallic archaea research. He told me the vocal cord parasites really existed. And not only did they exist, they had already been brought back to life in the modern age. An ancient human cadaver, host to the parasites of the time. Cypher excavated such a cadaver from a permafrost region and isolated the DNA coding of the vocal cord parasites. Naturally, they were long dead and could not be brought back, but there was an alternate vessel they could use. A relative species of the Pentastomida discovered in China. It had adapted to live in the nasal cavity of animal hosts. But its genetic sequence showed signs of common ancestry with the vocal cord parasites. Ontogenesis, a path of an organism to maturity, is like a roadmap of the phylogenetic evolution of the entire strain. Cypher used this to effect a reverse evolution of the modern parasite and resurrect the vocal cord parasites. They 
interposed a developmental mechanism to the ontogenetic stage analogous to when the relative species first appeared, the point at which it split from the vocal cord parasites, forcing its evolution down the other path, the vocal cord parasite path. The larvae is produced by the vocal cord parasites, reborn. I do not know in detail how Cypher accomplished this, but clearly they have access to high-level genetic technologies. Skullface said it was the work of a genius woman scientist, and that the relative species in question was first discovered by a group once called the Philosophers. I was tasked with modifying the resurrected parasites. He charged me with two demands. First, to add lethality to these organisms that had once lived in peace with man. By unleashing the larvae's latent desire to consume nutrients from the host's lung tissue, making them eat and eat until the lungs were destroyed. Second, to have both male and female inhabit the same host and copulate then and there only when exposed to specific pronunciations continuously over an extended time. What he would do to the Diné if I failed? I had no choice. Originally, the ultimate objective of the ethnic cleansing parasite project was the identification of not only languages, but of actual cultures. Language is deeply connected to ethnicity, but many languages are employed by multiple ethnic groups, and confrontation between those ethnic groups is by no means rare. If the cleanser parasites were to be a deterrent against ethnic conflict, they had to distinguish between groups using means other than pure language. The original plan called for this to be achieved by differences in the transmission vector. Each ethnic group has different lifestyle customs and eating habits. For instance, parasites living in shallow water and taken in through the skin could be used to target rice farming groups. Or parasites using cows as their intermediate host would be ineffective against cultures that abstain from eating beef. But that is a lofty goal indeed. The current parasites mainly rely on droplet transmission. It would take extensive time to alter the transmission route. I eventually learned that the ethnic cleansers project had been shut down. It was Skullface who put it back into operation. But despite that, he told me to forget about the transmission route and just focus on language identification. I do not know why. I understand that the Chinese philosophers who discovered the relative species of parasite originally planned to develop a phonogrammic Alexia parasite. The left temporal parietal region is home to the part of the brain that identifies the phonetic symbols of the English language. They wished to create a strain that would parasitize that region and suppress its literacy functions. The brain area responsible for identifying the logographs of Chinese, meanwhile, is in the left middle frontal gyrus, meaning that even if native speakers of Chinese were infected with the parasite, the literacy would be unaffected. Old and new, east and west, there is no limit to the delusions of those in power. But this delusion threatens to become a reality. I have to do something to stop this. There must be something I can do.